Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mindy Mitchell, Director for Individual Homeless Adults here at the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Um, we'll get started with just a couple housekeeping tips about the webinar platform. All participants will be muted except for speakers and panelists during presentations. But at any time during the webinar, you can enter questions for speakers into the question box on the right of your screen. I'm joined today by my colleague from our capacity building team, Christy Schulenberg, who will be gathering your questions throughout the webinar and who will be joining our panelists to answer as many of those questions as we can at the end of all the presentations. Additionally, this webinar and the slides will be made available after the broadcast. So today we're going to hear um, about some new data related to youth rapid rehousing and assessment tools and put those analyses in context by hearing about some best practices from a great youth rapid rehousing provider. And stay tuned the whole hour today because I will have a big youth rapid rehousing New Year's announcement for you at the end of the webinar. Joining us today are some of our country's most important researchers on youth homelessness, Dr. Eric Rice from the University of Southern California's School of Social Work, and Dr. Matthew Morton, who is a research fellow at Chapin Hall and the principal investigator for Voices of Youth Count. They are joined by Dr. Shun Ta Su from the University of Missouri, and they will share with us a recent analysis by their organizations and our partners at Youth Collaboratory of two to three years of intake assessments and HMIS data on nearly 11,000 young people from 16 communities across the country. Next, we'll hear from Jeffrey King and Vera Beach with Community Rebuilders, which is a great provider of many different programs in Grand Rapids, Michigan, including an awesome youth rapid rehousing program that they're going to tell us more about. Then we'll be opening up the conversation for your questions for our great panel of experts. Um, again, you can submit your questions at any time in the box on the right of your screen. And finally, as I mentioned, I will have an exciting announcement at the end of the webinar that you won't want to miss. Okay, let's get started. Um, here's our agenda for today, which I basically just covered, so I won't do that again. And uh, to get us started, as always, on these webinars, here's our reminder about what we mean when we say rapid rehousing. It's a housing first permanent housing intervention that helps people find housing quickly, pay for housing, and maintain that housing through voluntary case management services that connect people to all of the community resources that they need to achieve stability. But why are we even having this conversation about youth rapid rehousing specifically? Well, first of all, you all have been really ramping up your youth rapid rehousing game across the country. So way to go on that. Um, these are the total HUD McKinney Vento awards for youth specific rapid rehousing programs in the past few years. And this is not even including any of the funding from the youth homelessness demonstration program. Um, I should also note here that many more 18 to 24 year olds are being served with rapid rehousing funding that is not population specific. So the amount of McKinney Vento rapid rehousing funding going to youth is actually much higher than what we see here. These numbers also do not include rapid rehousing funding from other systems like TANF, which serves many young parents experiencing homelessness, or the Veterans Administration, whose SSVF rapid rehousing program does serve a small number of young veterans experiencing homelessness. But this other chart provides a really good reason why we want to talk about youth rapid rehousing. From the most recent AHAR, we know that at least half of the young people experiencing homelessness on a single night were unsheltered. So why does rapid rehousing matter if we're talking about undressing unsheltered youth homelessness? Well, the answer to that question um, we can get from revisiting some, one of the big lessons that we learned from the past couple of years of the Rapid Rehousing for Youth Learning Community. It's this one. Rapid Rehousing is not just a housing model, it's a systemic response. What I mean by that is that while we know we need more shelter capacity to address unsheltered youth homelessness, 
We can also amplify our existing shelter capacity by dedicating more resources to permanent housing assistance with rapid rehousing. So to help you see what we mean by that, our research staff created this handy graphic. Um, Eric, Matt, and Shinta, I freely acknowledge that this is super simplistic and not at all mathematically accurate but it hopefully helps to visualize how thinking at a systems level about how we allocate homelessness funding can improve flow through the homelessness system and help us get more young people off the street and back into housing more quickly. So what we saw on that slide is that we have some shelter beds and a few rapid rehousing beds in our imaginary community, but we have a whole bunch of people outside and very few of them are ever getting inside, much less into their own permanent housing. So we want to do something about all those folks who are unsheltered. Well, we can add some shelter capacity. And that's good for the people who got to come in off the street. But we still don't have any more permanent housing for people, so the flow out of unsheltered homelessness is still pretty stagnant. We could also decide to use our community's homelessness resources to add more rapid rehousing beds. This helps flow people more quickly out of shelter, which frees up shelter beds, and that increases flow into shelter from the street. Again, this is not at all mathematically accurate, though uh, technical assistance experts like those on our capacity building team are able to analyze your local data and help communities make more informed decisions about how to better design their homelessness systems in just this way to increase flow. And again, this is not an either or calculation in real life. When we have such high unsheltered numbers, we know we do need more shelter capacity and new COC tools like the THRRH joint component can help us with that. But because housing is the actual solution to homelessness, we have to make that a primary consideration as we assess our community's needs and make decisions about how we're allocating resources to improve the flow from homelessness to house. So that's why we're talking about youth rapid rehousing and now we'll get started with our presenters. Um, we're really excited to hear from these panelists and uh, their, their research that they have done, which is super awesome. Um, so take it away guys, I am unmuting you now. Great. Thanks so much, Mindy. Uh, so this is Matt Morton, and I'm going to get us started and then pass it on to Eric and Sinta. Uh, we really appreciate your time and allowing us into this uh, learning collaborative today. And thank you so much, Mindy, and to the folks at NAH. Uh, so as you can see, this is part of a, a broader collaborative uh, effort, uh, initiative uh, between a, a group of us nerds uh, who are all trying to use our nerd powers to support the movement to end youth homelessness. And uh, so this is one reflection of that. And uh, I hope that uh, all of you have either seen or will take time after this webinar uh, to uh, go to Chapin Hall and uh, our website or Youth Collaboratory's website to uh, pull up the broader research that we are doing on um, a system response toward ending youth homelessness. Uh, this work leverages uh, our partnerships uh, between uh, USC, uh, Chapin Hall, University of Missouri, Youth Collaboratory, uh, and with uh, financial support from uh, the Schultz Family Foundation and, and Schmidt Futures. And uh, really what we're doing is taking a bunch of available data that has not been used from across multiple communities that follows young people over uh, two or three years uh, period of time. And, uh, and trying to uh, tease out from all of that valuable uh, system data uh, as many answers to important questions as we possibly can to support your work uh, as communities to address youth homelessness. The three questions that we're gonna focus on today uh, based on our analysis of these data uh, are uh, first, how effective is rapid rehousing for youth? This isn't a formal impact evaluation, um, but uh, by looking at uh, outcomes data for young people over time who participated in rapid rehousing compared to those that, that came into systems who didn't, we can start to get some insights into how 
well rapid rehousing is working for young people. Uh, secondly, we ask uh, who should get rapid rehousing, uh, and particularly thinking about um, young people's uh, risk or acuity scores uh, when they come into a system and some of the demographic characteristics of young people and seeing what patterns we can pull out. And then third is trying to understand what disparities uh, in placement exist, whether there are uh, racial and ethnic um, disparities in particular be behind who gets placed in different types of housing programs or interventions and who doesn't. Next slide. Uh, a lot of this analysis is really based on, um, actually all of this analysis is based on data that was furnished by uh, org code and many of you will know org code. They're a uh, private firm uh, that has developed um, the um, TAY uh, they, they, I spit at um, um, youth screening or triage uh, tool. Uh, it's a commonly called the next step tool for homeless youth. So some of you would would know it as TAVI spit at, and some of you would know it as the next step tool. Uh, and this is, uh, to our knowledge, the most widely used triage tool uh, for coordinated entry and assessment systems uh, to prioritize which young people have the highest level of vulnerability for extended periods of homelessness and therefore make decisions about which young people <clears throat> should get prioritized for which level of services. The slide that's in front of me, uh, front, in front of you right now, shows a scoring rubric that's recommended by org code uh, for the uh, TAVI spit out or the next step tool. It basically says if a young person scores uh, at a very low level, zero to three, uh, that that in the context of very limited resources, that young person uh, could receive no uh, or no or um, or very moderate intensity um, services uh, at that time, um, and uh, and that youth who score a four to seven should be uh, prioritized for more time limited time limited and uh, moderate intensity services. Um, and uh, those with a score of eight and above are considered very high acuity or high vulnerability and in need of longer term housing and more high intensity services. In practice, many communities have operationalized this to mean that those getting uh, a score of a four to seven um, should be uh, prioritized for something like rapid rehousing and those scoring eight or above should be prioritized for um, permanent supportive housing as a high intensity resource. Uh, but the scoring rubric really has had no research behind it. Um, it was based on you know, best guesses and thinking at the time. Uh, but now this analysis allows us to really interrogate this guidance and see if there uh, is room for improvement. Uh, next slide. So what we've done is we've taken a, a large data set that was provided by ORCODE. So with uh, many of the communities that ORCODE is involved in, uh, ORCODE has been working with those communities to collect uh, administrative data. And what's cool about this administrative data is that it links the next step tool data. So the uh, triage screening scores and variables um, that are captured. Uh, on every young person that comes into an intake process. Uh, it links those assessment scores or triage scores uh, and variables with homelessness management information system data. So that allows us to see uh, which young people uh, are um, getting placed into which services and uh, which young people um, come back into the, the local homelessness system over time. So the primary outcome that we're able to look at is whether a young person uh, stays in the homelessness system or returns to the homelessness system after exiting. And uh, there's a lot more we'd like to know, but this is a really important starting point that we can look at with HMIS data. We have data on about 11,000 young people, ages 15 to 24. Uh, so pretty good sized data set from 16 different communities across 10 states, covering pretty much every uh, major region of the United States. We get rural, suburban, and urban communities all mixed in here, so it's a pretty good look. We capture data from 2015 to about 2017, so about uh, two and a half years uh, worth of data that we can follow up on um, many of these young people. 
Uh, what's also cool about it is it is longitudinal in nature. So it's not a snapshot. It actually lets us look at how young people come into the system and how they do over time. Uh, there are a lot of benefits that I've already mentioned, but there are also really big drawbacks. Um, many of you will want information that we don't have simply because it's not collected or provided in these HMIS data. So, for example, uh, today we're going to look at rapid rehousing. We do not know the length of rapid rehousing um, in each community. And even within communities, we all know that the length of subsidies can vary. So, if we show you results of young people um, and their housing stability over one year from starting um, these programs, uh, for some young people, that one year time period will look um, after they exited uh, or they finished the rapid rehousing uh, subsidy period if the subsidy was six months long. Uh, but for other young people, they might receive rapid rehousing support for two years. And so then we're capturing their outcomes in the middle of the program period. So that's a major caveat um, that we have in the data. Another one is we can't compare it to some of the other housing and shelter models that are available, like transitional living programs. Uh, but that being said, this is a really important first step um, with a solid bit of data to start to get new insights for a first time on rapid rehousing for youth in the absence of formal evaluations that have been done on this program model with this population. Uh, so we hope that you find it helpful. And with that, I'm passing over to Eric. Great. Um, so let's go right on to the next slide, if you don't mind. Um, <clears throat> the first thing to note here is that of these 11,000 young people, rapid rehousing was the intervention that was used the most frequently across these 16 communities. So we had almost 3,000 young people placed into rapid rehousing, which is great. And, and I think, you know, sort of speaks to uh, Mindy's uh, a uh, funnel diagram of the, the capacity for rapid rehousing to be an, uh, an intervention that can get a, a large number of people off the streets. If we go to the next slide. The first thing that I want to point out, and, and, and Matt alluded to this, is that if you look at this graph and you look at the, uh, the orange bars, which is the rapid rehousing, you can see what we have here is the scores from the next step tool along the bottom. And most communities are using rapid rehousing as this medium uh, level moderate intervention. So there's a small number of people scoring four, a lot of people who score five, six, and seven who are given rapid rehousing. And for um, the benefits of this analysis is actually that a number of communities tried giving it to folks who scored eight or nine, despite the fact that that is typically what is viewed as the cut point for um, high intensity services. Can we look at the next slide, please? So what I want to point out here is that if we look at one year of stability, so this is, you know, the number of young people who did not return to homelessness uh, for one year after their initial placement into either rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing, we can see that one year out, there's a, you know, most everyone is still doing very well. It's about 83% of the rapid rehousing placements, uh, those young people did not return to homelessness and about 90% of the permanent supportive housing uh, placements, people did not return to homelessness. So not quite as effective as PSH, but almost as effective. And as Matt pointed out, please uh, be aware, oh, you can go to the next slide. Please be aware that this is outcomes which are uh, potentially in the middle of the program of rapid rehousing because this is saying for 365 days from the time of initial placement which in some communities may be right in the middle of when these young people are are still getting rental subsidies so this is not a year after subsidies end uh, this graph shows and i really just want you to focus in on the yellow line uh, is that the percentage of people who were successful across different scores for rapid rehousing and what I want to point out with this graph is really that even at scores of eight and nine, more than 80% of the young people who were placed into rapid rehousing were successful in that housing. So if we could go to the next slide, I'm going to show one more piece of geeky data. So for those of you who ever took a statistics class, you're probably thinking, oh my God, not a bell curve. That's horrible. You can look at the, the notes on the side here and, and, get, and get what we're trying to get out of this. So the point of this is that I think that rapid rehousing is an effective intervention, at least in the short term, 
for folks who score eight and nine, and that I think that communities can be thinking about uh, bumping their PSH cut point up to 10 and, and extending their rapid rehousing to eights and nines. And this, is, and this is the logic behind that. The first piece is what I showed you in the last graph, which was that more than 80% of the eights and nines were successful for at least one year. So that's gr really good news. The second thing is the distribution, and that's why I showed this, this bell curve. So for those of you who like bell curves, here's the bell curve. For those of you who don't, I'll walk you through this briefly. If we are trying to house everyone who scores an eight or above, what that means is that we're trying to give 25% of the young people who enter our systems of care permanent supportive housing. That's a lot of young people that we're spending a lot of money on. However, if we change the scoring such that we, we are doing four through nine for rapid rehousing, that can actually be an intervention that is viable for 82% of the young people who we see on the streets, which means that we only have to use the expensive permanent supportive housing for 10% of the young people who we see. Now, I have not done a formal cost analysis, but any back of the envelope sort of calculation that you could do on this in your community, I'm sure will yield the result that that's going to be a cost saving. And it's going to also enable you to probably get young people, more young people into these programs more quickly. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shunta, who's gonna to talk to us about the speed with which things happen and the, some of the barriers to that. Thank you very much. Um, next slide, please. So because of the, um, the term rapid in referee housing, and because we know that um, for youth experience homelessness, the longer they wait for their housing placement, the less likely they are able to achieve um, stable homelessness exit. We're interested in now, in current practice, um, how long does do youth wait um, for their um, referee housing placement? And what we found based on our data, um, youth who experienced homelessness waited about um, over four months, um, 131 days, uh, to be placed into referee housing program. And there are actually variations. Uh, some youth may experience prolonged wait time for Rapid housing program, some youth may not. And the graph shows that um, <clears throat> uh, for the upper 25% of youth, uh, in terms of wait time, um, they waited about at least um, 173 days, which is about um, six months. And for the 50 percentile, they waited about uh, four months. And for the lower 25%, they waited about uh, two months. Um, 75, two, two and a half months, 75 days. So this graph provides uh, a general information regarding how long youth wait for uh, referee housing placement. It doesn't give us much information regarding um, whether there are disparities among homeless youth regarding uh, wait time uh, for referee housing. And um, basically we try to know who are more vulnerable to experience prolonged uh, waiting time to be placed into referee housing program. Next slide. So this graph compares uh, minor youth who age um, 17, 17 or younger versus uh, non-minor youth, youth who age um, 18 or above regarding their wait time. So basically what this graph shows is that minor youth experience a uh, longer period of time to be placed into uh, referee housing program as compared to uh, non-minor youth. Um, it could be the case that, you know, a lot of the uh, referee housing program units come from uh, private landlords, and landlords may have some concerns regarding leasing their, uh, leasing their units for minor youth. They may be worried about their independent living skills, they may be worried about potential uh, legal issues and also potential guardianship uh, issues. That, you know, uh, makes minor youth to wait a longer period of time to find their uh, referee housing program. And next slide. And we're also interested to know where homeless, where youth experience homelessness, um, they spend most of their time while experiencing homelessness 
and their wait time to be placed into the rapid housing program. So basically, this graph shows that youth who spend most of their time in emerging shelters and also in transitional living programs, they compare to youth who are couch surfing or uh, spend more, most of their time outdoors while experiencing homelessness. Youth who engage in systems experience less time, uh, less wait time to be placed into rapid housing program. It could be the case that youth who are already engaged in systems, you know, service systems, emerging shelters and traditional living programs, they are familiar with the system. And also the system may be more familiar with them. So they are able to be placed into a rapid housing program in a, a, a more timely manner as compared to youth who experience couch serving and also spend time outdoors uh, while experiencing homelessness. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, thank you. So uh, this graph, finally, we're trying to compare um, youth who are in rural area versus youth who are in urban area regarding their, their wait, wait time to be placed into rapid housing programs. And what we found is that youth in rural area um, experience longer period of wait time to be placed into rapid housing program as compared to youth in urban area. Um, there could be two potential explanations. One may be the case that um, in rural area, there just maybe there are enough um, housing units, but not enough services to match them uh, or to place them into appropriate um, rapid housing unit. Or it could be uh, the other explanation is that compared to urban communities, rural communities may simply not have enough uh, avail available housing units so that youth who experience homelessness will have to wait a longer period of time in order to place into rapid housing program. Because of the restriction of the data, uh, we are not able to validate which may be the potential uh, explanation, and it could be both. And this may warrant a future more detailed um, study in this area. And I'm passing to Dr. Rice for the final conclusion. Yeah, so I will just give a couple key takeaway messages. So the the couple things that we wanted to suggest was that we that you know rapid rehousing is working for most everybody that it's given to, including folks who have eights and nines. I think that uh, more experimentation with ten and higher is an important thing to do with the caveat that Matt brought in, which is that these are short-term outcomes, which may also reflect continued engagement um, in, in programming. So it may not be, we really don't know what happens after rapid rehousing subsidies end. We can't really tell the difference uh, between whether or not these have ended and they're still stable or if they're stable with the, with the assistance that's through the rapid rehousing vouchers. And that disparities exist, especially minor youth needing more help, rural communities needing more help, and couch surfers and folks who are sleeping on the streets needing additional help, which may reflect in both, you know, in, in all of these cases, I think reflect the need for more services and engagement services, both for minors to help them navigate those systems and rural communities to help them navigate those systems, and also for these young people who are having trouble with um, their previous lack of engagement in homeless youth services needing additional assistance to navigate those systems. And so the final slide is uh, simply our thank you slide, and we look forward to a dialogue with all of you. And just note here, um, if you take a quick screenshot of this, um, or if the slides go out, yeah, here are two links, one for the paper um, that's with the uh, first half of the analysis, the, the results Shinta presented, are uh, under review currently, and there's also the link for the Chapin Hall uh, brief that Matt Morton took the lead on. And thank you all. Thanks so much, guys. Um, this is super exciting research, and the field is really so lucky to have you all working on this issue. Um, hang on just a sec. I am muting. Okay. Um, I will say just um, in passing because it got brought up, we know that progressive engagement is super important across populations and more and more communities are really uh, ramping up their progressive engagement game. So I think we'll see a lot more um, uh, work on that for young people too, um, meaning starting with rapid rehousing. And then if that doesn't work after um, 
potentially a couple of years of intervention, then you know that you need to move up to PSH and it really is much more expensive. Um, I will say too, um, I, I know that there were minor youth that were served in these communities. We, uh, the Alliance generally does not recommend rapid rehousing for minor youth uh, for lots of reasons. And the biggest one is just that in most states, minors can't sign leases. Um, so, so there's that piece of it, which I think is probably the biggest barrier to getting minors into rapid rehousing programs. Um, I'm also uh, uh, want to see more and more work about targeting to young people who are outside. So it'll be uh, interesting to see what happens on that moving forward. Um, of course, I'm a bigger uh, big picture data geek than most, but when it comes to moving the needle on youth homelessness in local communities, it's so important that we hear from the innovative providers and systems leaders who are putting those interventions into practice. So next up, we're gonna have uh, Jeffrey King from Community Rebuilders in Grand Rapids, who is gonna tell us more about that great program. Um, Jeff, even though I am, of course, technologically challenged, uh, I believe that I embedded this video correctly. So, do you want to tell us what we're about to watch? Yeah, thanks, Mindy. Um, yeah, my name is Jeffrey King. I'm the Director of Advancement and Communications at Community Rebuilders. We're a nonprofit housing agency operating out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. We're on the state's west side. Um, we've been operating uh, rapid rehousing for about uh, 10, 11 years, um, but specifically providing youth rapid rehousing projects funded by HUD over the last three years. Now, what we're going to show first is just a real brief video from one of our rapid rehousing youth collaborative participants. Her name is Jennifer Brown, and she just wanted to be able to share a little bit about um, how rapid rehousing supported some of her personal goals that she had and uh, really the integration back into community that was so successful. So, Mindy, yeah, if you want to go ahead and just hit play there. Okay. And I will say, uh, Jennifer had hoped to join us on the webinar today, but uh, she's working. Yeah. Oh, hang on, let me turn up my volume. Oh, I hope I can get this to work. Hang on, guys. Uh, okay, Jennifer, so what do you like uh, most about having your own place? I love the creativity of Okay, I am so sorry. It looks like we might not be able to work on the um, webinar platform. So, Jeff, so sorry about that. And everyone, we'll be sending out these slides. We'll um, be able to watch Jennifer's video after the webinar. Again, I apologize. So, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, one of the one of the things that we really just wanted to convey with, with the message from Jennifer. And Mindy, I think I, I appreciate you trying to embed that video. She didn't want to be here today, but uh, she's working. Uh, one of her three jobs that she holds down in the Grand Rapids area um, in order to support herself in her own housing. Um, and one of the things that Jennifer really emphasizes in that video, which I think was even important for our staff to hear, um, was that she had many times been connected to different housing resources in our community, but there was often this belief or misnomer that with a small amount of assistance, she wouldn't be successful. And a lot of those organizations and staff really internalized that that lack of success was gonna um, impact them. So as a result, there just weren't efforts that were made to support her in getting back into housing. So Jennifer says, like, 
it's still not always easy, but I have a roof over my head. I'm in a neighborhood that I love. Uh, I work really hard. It all falls on my shoulders, but that's okay. I am okay. Uh, and that's sometimes I think one of the challenges that we've seen even in our own community with advancing rapid rehousing work for young people is this belief that they're not going to be okay at the end and, and why would we do that to them? And Jennifer really conveyed that well in that, uh, yes, there are still struggles, but she feels like she's in a good place to be able to continue that work on her own. She's been out of the program now for over a year and is, is still living in the same apartment she um, was living in when she moved in with her rapid rehousing assistance and support from our team. So just kind of a, a cool uh, message. So a little bit more about community rebuilders. We've been in operation for about 25 years and we started doing rapid rehousing with families um, in late 2007. <clears throat> and that early work with families in, in transitioning a traditional transitional housing program into a rapid rehousing program uh, was a uh, kind of a bold move on our part at that time. And there wasn't a lot of that work that was happening in our community, but we saw a lot of results really quickly, really positive results with families. And that is we were able to serve significantly more with the dollars that we were being allocated and the outcomes were significantly better. That, and those outcomes being people were exiting uh, successfully to permanent housing and they were also staying permanently housed six, 12 and 24 months after exiting their program. <clears throat> so with increased work uh, around families and increased work with veterans through our SSVF grant, we also started to see that we were serving more young people, both accompanied and unaccompanied young people, so young people with children. And we were seeing that in our family programs, we were seeing those in our veteran programs, and we realized that there wasn't really a body of work supporting rapid rehousing for young people, though we had been doing it for, for many years. So uh, we took an opportunity to apply for uh, HUD rapid rehousing funding dedicated to young people and with some great partnerships that included our coordinated entry system, outreach partners and employment services, we've been able to uh, move forward with this expanded uh, rapid rehousing services for Kent County youth that has produced some pretty cool outcomes. So we're really excited to share this and I'm really excited to read some of this other data that our uh, other panelists are putting out there that really support uh, good work being done around progressive engagement in serving higher, like highly vulnerable young people. So one, we recognize that there are challenges. Oh, sorry, I mean, you can go back just one. Um, that there are challenges to providing rapid rehousing for young people. And there are a lot of the same challenges that we heard when we were serving families and when we serve veterans or even when we serve chronically homeless individuals. And a lot of those challenges are around um, first, uh, serving highly vulnerable young people that have maybe never lived on their own before, <clears throat> serving uh, young people in your rapid rehousing programs that have zero income, serving people in your rapid rehousing programs that maybe have past evictions or criminal histories, and a lot of that um, can turn into participant fear, that they will not be able to find a home, that no landlord will rent to them, that they'll end up homeless again. But we also recognize that our staff also have a lot of these fears too, that they won't be able to house these individuals and that they won't be successful in the program. And then we also recognize that landlords have a fear too, that it can be a bad investment um, and a community challenge. Um, are these really the most vulnerable households experiencing homelessness? Um, what do we do? Um, do we shelter households for an extended period of time to get them housing ready, or do we deny them services? And we've really been committed since the very beginning to utilizing our coordinated entry system to ensure that we were having the most highly vulnerable youth uh, referred to our projects. And for us, that was really being able to identify those unsheltered young people, those young people that were living in our community, either in vehicles or in tent encampments, where there was oftentimes a lot of very predatory adults and unsafe behaviors that were going on. And those were really the young people that we wanted to target, um, those most vulnerable and those most likely to die on the street. You can go to the next slide, please. So this is just kind of a brief overview of what we saw overall um, <clears throat> as far as results. Now, this is across all of our rapid rehousing programs, but we like to see where there's consistencies and inconsistencies among populations. Um, understanding that for many folks, th there's maybe that belief that um, young people need a special type of intervention, just like veterans need a special kind of intervention or families do. But what we saw is that we're res our results are really consistent across the board. So this is really just a snapshot of a 12 month period <clears throat> that was able to provide us with good information on successful exits, income increases and numbers served. One of the things I think we were most proud about with our youth rapid rehousing program 
is that 80% of those individuals that were served um, out of that cohort of uh, uh, 50 young adults with 83 people in the households, 80% of them came from places not meant for human habitation. So those were those young people that our outreach team were specifically identifying out in the community, living on the streets, living in encampments, but not in our shelter system, not doubled up, um, and not unhappily housed, but those young people that were on the street. Now, that effort was really only possible because we included with this youth rapid rehousing project an outreach component. Um, not because we wanted to create something that's separate and outside of the system, but we wanted to be able to use our coordinated entry as a walk-in point, but are also our outreach teams as an opportunity to get out there and engage young people and actually have a housing resource in hand when they met with them so that then we could then prioritize all these young people at our coordinated entry to ensure we were serving those who are most vulnerable. Now, our community does use the VI SPIT app um, across all populations, but for the purposes of our youth rapid rehousing project, because we wanted more of that outreach to be able to happen in the field, we wanted to uh, utilize an assessment that was that assisted both with determining eligibility and determining vulnerability, and could also be completed um, in, in a quicker manner and maybe was a little less invasive. So we actually developed our own assessment within our community, kind of identifying um, where some of our needs and wants were, and where, like when we were looking at the data, where we were seeing most of that vulnerability at. So those were the individuals that we wanted to target. So those individuals that were living in encampments, um, those individuals that were having interactions with predatory adults, those, those young people that were having interactions with law enforcement, those were the young people that we wanted to target. So we geared our local assessment, which is just a quick 15 questions that tallies up at the end, but that allows us to um, immediately identify if an individual is both eligible and um, most vulnerable for that project. So as you can see from this, 98% of these, those young people exited um, stably housed. And another thing that I've even shared with Mindy in the Alliance, um, interestingly, is that our young people actually experienced some of the biggest increases in income. Um, so about 68% of them came into the project with zero income. The majority of them leave with income and, and across all populations, they tend to see the largest increase, um, which was really exciting for us as well. Um, next slide, please. Jeff, can you explain what the average monthly increase means? Yeah, so that's just utilizing that HUD measure. Um, I can't remember the exact field that it falls into, but that's, that is just the average monthly increase per household after they've exited. In income? So that's not, that's not the amount of income that they have, it's the average monthly increase. Okay. So with, uh, with this model that we're utilizing, it's really about creating these win-win-win <clears throat> track transactions. Um, and recognizing that, the, that there, are, like, there are fears that people have about providing rapid rehousing to young people, but that you can create win-win-win situations. So reducing fear amongst all three partners in the transaction is very important. Um, and that includes our participants, landlords, and those that are in the helping relationship, in our case, the housing resource specialists. So uh, first and foremost, we start with how can we create that culture of creative solutions amongst our staff? So we train our staff to never make promises that they cannot keep. Um, we cannot guarantee that our participant will make a great tenant. Uh, we cannot guarantee that they will increase their income and pay their rent. We focus on what we can control. So we will ensure our portion of rent is always on time. We will always give 30 day notice prior to terminating our assistance. And we will uh, work to ensure all consumers have a full understanding of their lease in terms of tenancy and we will ensure all participants have goals around increasing income and that we make paying rent each month on time a priority. So that takes a lot of training with our staff and that's where we try to focus most of our energies. So focus, uh, versus focusing on retraining our participants or our consumers, uh, it's really about retraining our staff to, to, to create those win-win-win situations. It's important for participants to know um, that we believe they will succeed we do that by focusing on strengths and natural support systems first. <clears throat> we are curious and want to learn from our participants. We want to know how have you increased income in the past? How have you found an apartment in the past? And then what are the skills and abilities that we can capitalize on um, to put some money in your pocket right now? So we're oftentimes thinking really creatively about um, increasing income, though we have seen that many young people around us have uh, obtained you know, the standard nine to five job or, or a part-time job while going to school. Um, others find more creative ways to make job, uh, to make some money. So 
for example, you, you, well, you didn't get to see that full video with Jennifer, but she has her part-time job at a local bakery, um, but she also does some live performance art and music, and she uh, did some theater stuff around Halloween to make a little extra money. So we're always looking at like creative ways that people can utilize their strengths, capitalize on those uh, to increase their income. We know that many uh, mainstream workforce development programs don't work for our participant base. base. Um, folks don't have time in our programs to complete lengthy and time-consuming job readiness programs. Uh, these may be long-term goals that our consumers have, but we focus on ways in which our participants can immediately increase income, identify skills that households might have for like changing oil or babysitting, painting, yard work, getting really creative about that. Um, we also recognize that rapid rehousing programs are not poverty elimination programs. So yes, when people exit our programs, they may still be living in poverty, but our goal is to ensure that they're in the safest place possible to continue to increase their income and to con continue to increase their natural support system to support that housing long-term. Um, so we, we really focus on like trying, learning, and trying again. So building success will take time, but that success will cement your project in the private rental market. It's important for landlords to know that your staff are here to support their consumers and that one of our key indicators is that participants increase their income and maintain their housing long term. So using this model, we've built a solid uh, set of outcomes that we can now use to promote our projects across the community. We also do not advocate for incentives. Um, our ways of differentiating or other ways of differentiating our participants from other households using the private rental market. Our goal is to create a balanced business transaction between the participant and the landlord. So we wanna normalize that relationship as much as possible so that we can disengage in services and then the household can address concerns directly with the landlord should they arise and have them addressed by the landlord. Uh, we also advocate for safe and affordable housing. This is accomplished through HQS and fair market rents. We manage negotiations that create the best possible outcomes for participants and the landlords, and that is safe, affordable housing and long-term tenancy. Um, that's really the basis of that of that entire model. And it's interesting is that it's a very similar model that we use with uh, uh, veterans in rapid rehousing and families in rapid rehousing. Oftentimes, uh, what we're finding is that youth don't need something uh, completely different or um, they don't need something that's, that's completely modified for them. There may be additional services that you pull in because they're young people, but at the end of the day, what's ending their homelessness is housing. Uh, next slide. And yeah, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I just, your program is awesome. And um, and I think I'm pretty forward thinking on the whole like housing first and all of that. Uh, and you always challenge me too. So that's a good thing. Um, hang on. Sorry, everybody. I have to keep uh, muting on my end. Okay. So uh, let's get right to our questions. Thanks to all the presenters. Um, we are going to try to have everyone answer as many questions as we can get to uh, that you submitted during the presentation. Christy will continue to gather those. She's also going to be available during this Q&A if we need answers on any uh, technical assistance kinds of questions. Um, first up uh, for our research crew, um, can you talk about any correlations that you found between higher scores and longer waits to get into uh, rapid rehousing or even PSH? I think I unmuted all of you. Eric, Shinta, Matt, you still with us? Yeah, we Hello. are. Eric, Hi. Uh, do you want to speak yeah. to that one? Sure, sure. I thought I was unmuted, but apparently I muted myself and you'd muted me, so it's just like a triple mute or double mute situation. All right. Um, <laughs> we have looked at how um, overall scores related to a reduced likelihood of success, but you could see in those graphs, you know, the curves go down, but you're still having most people successful in our interventions, you know, with m more than 80%. Um, so, but as Shinta, maybe you can address this about wait times. Was NFT, was the score, the overall score related to wait time as well? I cannot remember. Yes. So, what we found is that we categorize uh, the score into three categories. So, 
um, high equity score, so basically people who are eligible for permanent supportive housing, um, middle range, which is um, by design to be prioritized with library housing programs, and also um, low score, meaning that you know people score for uh, three or less. And what we found is that the communities are doing a good job in terms of people who score the, the at the middle, they are being placed into referee housing programs in a shorter period of time, followed by people are scoring higher. The lowest is people who are for a uh, score three or below. And that may just be a reflection of a lack of investment in rapid rehousing in those low scoring youth. Um, so it's kind of like, I guess the story is if your community invests in a particular group of young people around rapid rehousing and provides them with the resources that they need to support them in that process, you'll get going in the, into rapid rehousing faster. Yeah, and I think it reflects that a lot of communities are following the guidance that's there, um, you know, that's been provided um, so far. Uh, but but I think it's also important to note in, in some of the Suntau's analysis that we found that even when you control for the score level, the longer the wait time, uh, the more likely, um, they're less likely young people are to, to stay safely housed once placed in a program. Thanks, guys. Hey, Jeff, um, and I think, uh, I don't think we know nationally for all populations what the average wait time is for rapid rehousing uh, or any other kind of housing intervention for that matter. We know we don't have enough. We know, I think we know that there's probably no community that's reached the ideal, except maybe on veterans, for getting people into uh, their own housing within 30 days of first becoming homeless. That's that's the big goal that everyone's shooting for, for the rapid part of it. Um, Jeff, what's your what's the wait time for uh, young people in your program? Yeah, so we've 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 seen increases. Uh, we are still our staff are still diligently working to meet that 30 day measure, and in some cases they still are. But I think we're seeing averages right now closer to 45, 50 days, um, which is one of the reasons why, like this next funding cycle, we looked at uh, and when talking with young people about how we could better meet that need, they had just identified that it was you know it was getting easier to get connected to resources. It was it was getting harder to stay connected. And it was mostly because they just needed a safe place to stay while they were looking for housing, which is why we jumped on that opportunity to do the joint rapid rehousing TH project so that we could just provide a safe space while they're working with staff to, to, to identify a permanent housing option. Thank you so much for bringing up the joint component, Jeff. Um, Christy, I wonder if you can take just a minute and let us all know about the joint component. I mentioned it briefly in my remarks, and I think there have been some questions on um, ways that we can either reduce the amount of time that young people are outside or program components that couch surfing youth are eligible for, which includes the joint component. Um, so can you tell folks that don't know just a little bit about what the joint component is? Sure. Uh, the joint component is a um, continuum of care uh, funded um, uh, housing intervention that HUD made available in for the first time in 2017 in the 2017 COC NOFA. And this was in response to, uh, for many reasons, um, among them where many communities were transitioning from uh, or reallocating voluntarily or involuntarily reallocating their uh, transitional housing um, programs uh, for youth and for families and for individual adults. And so um, there was a recognition of, uh, of the need to have a little bit more of a stronger exit strategy. So the joint component provides crisis housing opportunities and they see HUD sees the joint component transitional housing portion of that uh, project as being more uh, uh, crisis housing. So COC funds can't be used basically uh, for emergency shelter. And so since we're not HUD, I, I, I feel confident I can say this, but it was an opportunity for um, communities to use this joint component uh, to 
provide more crisis beds in their community. Um, and that obviously can be used for youth. But then at the same time, providing this opportunity for people to exit more quickly with the use of rapid rehousing dollars. So uh, it's a great um, opportunity for communities that are looking uh, for a component uh, housing intervention that uh, provides more crisis beds, um, but then has a pretty solid exit strategy in rapid rehousing. Um, in addition, the 2017 and 2018 COC NOFA allowed for those um, project participants who were in current transitional housing, um, if the project was being reallocated uh, to a joint component, for those same folks to be served in the new component. So we've seen that now two years in a row. So it provides some for some planning um, as well. So it's a, it's a great opportunity if you need additional crisis beds with the idea that you're going to you know, move those fo folks uh, quickly uh, into permanent housing through the rapid rehousing uh, part of that project. Awesome, thank you, Christy. Go ahead. Uh, this is Matt Morton. Uh, this is just really cool and I think um, is a really nice um, solution orientation around some of our, our findings here on wait times and the harm associated with those. Is there guidance that NAH or HUD has uh, presented that um, you know can help communities think about how to use that joint component way and, and sort of the ways that you just suggested? Yeah, we have that. HUD has some of that. Uh, again, like Christy said, folks are just getting started. Those awards, the first awards only happened in last year, and then the latest awards, the second round, just went out. Um, so we have some of those. For everyone who's on the webinar, we'll include that information when we send out the slides. Um, we are running short on time. So much great information. Um, I'm going to throw one last question for our researchers and then for Jeff really quickly. Um, so research guides, not to put you on the spot, but are we recommending, uh, to the extent that we can recommend, that uh, the org code BI SPDAT buckets might need to be changed? I am. I'll, sure. say, I'll, 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 I'll stand out on a limb and say that. Matt's less, Matt's less comfortable with that conclusion. So it's, it, I think uh, I'll let him speak for himself, but I, I think that we should be thinking about 10 and above for PSH and that we should be thinking rapid rehousing for those eights and nines. So it works, at least in the short term. Yeah, so I, I, I mostly agree with Eric there, so we're, we're pretty well aligned. Um, but. Uh, I also just want to remind folks that, you know, org code isn't saying that folks should follow those scores religiously, and I think that's still the case. They're meant to inform, right. not to decide. And so communities still need to look, use local information and use information. Um, but I think it's a, it's a good starting point to start thinking about um, broader applications for rapid rehousing, uh, especially given the harmful um, uh, results associated with long wait times. Yeah, and, and thank you for saying that. We love org code, and it's really important that communities have a uniform assessment tool. But even the great folks at org, org code tell communities, like, this shouldn't be the only thing that you're using uh, to make your decisions. And so, Jeff, can you talk again for folks about how, uh, yes, you do have that tool in your tool belt, but you're also using a different measure of assessment and eligibility for young people for these programs? Yeah, so we, we just recognize that there, there there were some shortcomings with that, with administering that particular assessment, and we wanted to be able to do it in a way that was both honoring to the young person, was recognizing the need that we were seeing in our own community, and also provided a balance between determining vulnerability, but also eligibility. So we, we wanted to be able to do that in a manner that was that was quick and efficient, and that we could have broad outreach teams out there engaging with young people, but then they could still be prioritized using a standard assessment for the Youth Rapid Rehousing Project. Um, that, that assessment's been really helpful for us so far, and that it has identified a, a really vulnerable group of young people, like I said, 80% who were um, staying in places not fit for human habitation, which is right. exactly the group that we wanted to target. Um, also, adding to that too, it, um, that assessment really just determines if, if if someone hits a threshold to be prioritized for that particular project. But we've really taken efforts to make sure that we're prioritizing all literally homeless young people for rapid rehousing first, 
and then determining down the road through that progressive engagement model if permanent supportive housing is ever going to be needed. And what we have right. found with the cohorts we've had so far um, is that additional that additional subsidy has not been needed, but with a range of anywhere between six to nine months of financial assistance, they're able to exit stably house. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, everybody, we are at time. Thanks, everybody, for hanging on just a second more. That's all the questions that we're able to get to during the webinar. But Christy and I are continuing to gather your questions. We'll pull them together, get answers from our panelists, and get those out to you as soon as we can. But before we go, as promised, I have some big news to get your new year started off right. The Alliance and our partners are launching a third year of the Rapid Rehousing for Youth Learning Community in 2019. Um, as you may remember, the Rapid Rehousing for Youth Learning Community convenes new and experienced youth rapid rehousing providers, local and state homeless systems, and mainstream agency administrators and national partners. Everyone who's interested in learning more about youth rapid rehousing and sharing information with one another to increase and improve youth rapid rehousing. Um, we've heard from so many of you that you are ready to move beyond Youth Rapid Rehousing 101, and that's exciting. So we'll have lots of great new content about Youth Rapid Rehousing and other important topics um, that we've already started to talk about today that affect the impact and the efficiency of Youth Rapid Rehousing at the community level. So those are things like progressive engagement, coordinated entry and assessment, the joint component, and diversion. Um, so to join us for the 2019 Rapid Rehousing for Youth Learning Community, just shoot me an email to sign up. Um, but by the way, if you were ever signed up for any of the previous Rapid Rehousing for Youth Learning Community webinars, you'll automatically be subscribed to the new newsletter. So that's my big announcement. Um, thank you to all of our awesome panelists for sharing your knowledge and insight. And thank you to everyone who's attending the webinar for all the great work you do every day to end youth homelessness. I wish everyone a wonderful whatever holiday you celebrate and a very happy 2019. See you all next year.